Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up, the American Society of Clinical Oncology holds its annual meeting this weekend on the agenda, Immunotherapy for Cancer. How do you harness the body's immune system to fight cancer? Here's John with more. In the fall of 2013, Kate Winnie's cancer doctors gave her some very bad news. We've gotten to that point now where unless something comes along, it's, that's, that's about it. At the time, Winnie was 52 and worn out from a seven-year battle against colon cancer that included radiation, nine surgeries, and multiple rounds of chemo. That's a pretty scary place to be. But Dr. Luis Diaz and colleagues at Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center tried a new approach. The immune system often has a hard time telling the difference between a normal cell and a cancer cell, but a specific mutation present in about 15 to 20 percent of colon cancers causes the cells to become very different from normal. Researchers theorize those highly abnormal cells would be much easier for the body's immune system to find. Can we give one of these medications that turns on the immune system and would that allow your immune system that, to then attack your tumor and remove it or eliminate it? Kate had that mutation and is part of a study of 38 patients with metastatic colon cancer who had failed conventional treatments. 13 had the genetic defect, 25 did not. All were given an immune-boosting drug called pembrolizumab. In 12 of the 13 with the genetic defect, the cancer either stopped growing or shrank. In the 25 others, the tumors continued to grow. You were seeing these, these people who were really in, in an emergency situation in their life being returned to normal. And that's a, that's a pretty incredible observation and feeling. Kate has received the therapy every two weeks for a year and a half. Her tumors have almost completely vanished and she hasn't felt this well in years. To have the blessing of being able to think down the road and say, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm intend to be here for that is really incredible. It is, it's my own miracle. So John, where does the research go from here? Well, of course, first replicate the results, larger studies, and we gotta figure out exactly who benefits from this because the treatment could be more than $100,000 a year. So this may be applicable not only to colon cancer but to other cancers because it's a really interesting idea that instead of saying breast, prostate, lung, like that, what are the genetic mutations and figure out maybe the same drug, the same technique could be applicable to other cancers. Next up, in the wake of Rita Wilson's breast cancer announcement in April, debate continues to grow over the importance and potential benefits of getting a second opinion. It does seem like a lot more people are talking about this. Sure. You know, there are a number of reasons to get a second opinion, but I think one of the most practical just comes down to peace of mind. Right. Uh, you know, if you have any questions about your diagnosis, uh, your treatment plan, or your prognosis, I, I think having that second set of eyes can be reassuring, and we all know we're more likely to to even follow medical advice if we believe in it. Right. But the other really true reason is that there can be errors in medicine, and there often are. Mm -hmm. uh, medicine is an imperfect science, um, and, and so often there are even gray areas where there's not a right or a wrong, so you need more opinions to kind of weigh in to end up in the right direction. I think a lot of people get the urge to ask for a second opinion when they don't like the first answer they get, right. which may be not the right reason, but when, I mean, when should you obtain a second opinion? You know, I think it's certainly not for routine matters. There, there, there won't be any benefit in going from doctor to doctor to see if your cholesterol is 199 versus 201. Uh, I think it's for more uh, serious diagnoses, especially those that may involve significant treatment, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's surgery for a valve replace, replacement or repair, or chemo or radiation, something where you really are considering significant treatment options or looking at a long-term prognosis. Uh, there are even companies that offer um, online second opinions, and that's all they do. And especially if you have a rare condition that, that, that we don't see often, it makes sense to even travel a bit to find a specialist that, that really focuses on that condition. How reliable is an online second opinion, though? 
Yeah, who knows, right? Yeah. It, it's online. I mean, I think this goes straight to the relationship between you and your patient. I mean, I'm an internist, gastroenterologist, and there are times when I want a second opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have to have your, the communication between you and your patient such that you're, you're looking at each other and say, you know, this has been going on for a few months. I really, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm too far down the rabbit hole. Let's just do blank slate, tabula rasa. Let's get somebody else's opinion. By the way, here's who I think you should go to. And conversely, the, uh, the patient should feel comfortable doing the same thing. But do you have some annoyance on your end? I know you said it's an inexact science, but when someone says, I kind of want a second opinion, are you ever like, well, you, you don't trust me? You know what? Not at all. And in fact, it's a great tell. It's a great marker for what kind of, of, of a doctor that you have. I actually embrace second opinions. I mean, you don't have to be smart, you just have to know somebody smart. Right. You know, if I don't know something about this, yeah, yeah exactly. all of you. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's benefit to that. And if you have a doctor who gets all upset because, oh, you want, you, you know, what's the matter, you don't trust me, that, that's just to tell that maybe that's not a good relationship and that, that doctor's really not secure enough. I get second opinions for myself all the time. You know, as an internist, yeah. I might have a, have a challenging case. I do, I call it phone a friend. And I'll even yeah. call a specialist and just run it by them. So so the patients absolutely have the right to do the same thing. But be careful because maybe you need a tiebreaker. You know, if you yeah. the, the yeah. first That's answer, true. the yeah. second one, maybe it's a tiebreaker. You can get caught which in the one, middle between, yeah. yeah. Which one right. do you believe? Well, you know, we missed you last week. You were doing some extensive yeah. travel back to Haiti again. Yeah. What's the situation like there since the earthquake? You know what? Um, I have to say, superficially, uh, it is improved. So mm -hmm. some of the things you see, first of all, you get out of the airport, and there's not that much rubble. A lot of it has been cleared away. And I have to say, it's not so much the locals tell me by the government. A lot of people came and took the debris and helped build their own homes. You don't see the tent camps as much across from the palace. There's actually green lawn. But again, this is superficial, but one of the things that I definitely noticed was the faces of the kids. I found myself among a couple of hundred uh, school kids who were getting, getting out waiting for the school bus, and they were pushing each other and yelling and laughing just like it could be anywhere uh, in any schoolyard anywhere. I have to say, though, behind that is still deep, deep problems in Haiti. Uh, mainly, they're trying to rebuild an infrastructure that never existed in the first place. Right. All right. Well, we're glad to have you back, Dr. John LaPook, Dr. Holly Phillips. Thank you both for being here this morning.